Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight um, to this in-person event, which is very exciting. Uh, the first one I think I've been <laughs> at UCSC, but um, anyway, we're very excited tonight to welcome you to the last of a three lecture series event, um, on Dante that was um, titled From the Margins, Dante 701 Years Later. Um, this series has been made possible by the generosity of the Siegfried and Elizabeth Mignon Pucknett Literary Studies Endowment and the Humanities Institute. And since it is the last one, I'd like to thank particularly Irena Polich and uh, Jessica Gill um, and Alice Falkins, who is not here, for their hard work and dedication to this series. Um, I could have never done any of this, so thank you very much. Um, so the spirit of this series was to, um, and is, to invite uh, reconsideration of Dante's work and afterlife from the perspective of his actual experience as a marginal lay intellectual who wrote in the vernacular at the time when that was not the language of learning, but also from the perspective of those marginal experiences that his work has helped give voice to. So tonight's talk it perfectly encapsulates that spirit as the title uh, well expressed from Levi to Dante, redefining humanities from the margin. Humanity from the margin, sorry. And I now leave the floor to Professor Nathaniel Deutsch, um, whom I thank you very much for leading our discussion tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Filippo. Um, I'm Nathaniel Deutsch. I'm a professor of history here at the university. And I also hold the Murray Baumgarten Chair in Jewish Studies. And I want to uh, point out that Professor Baumgarten is here today. He was a long time, he was a founder and long time uh, leader of Jewish studies here and not only contributed a lot uh, to, to the university in that way, but also established very close connections with uh, scholars and institutions in Venice and um, helped to, to, to create a really close relationship uh, with people there on the study of the ghetto, the Jewish ghetto in Venice. I also want to point out Margaret Bros, who's here today, who taught uh, Italian uh, at the university for many years um, and established a wonderful tradition that Filippo continues. So tonight we're going to uh, be talking about both Dante and Primo Levi, two great uh, Italian writers. Um, the scholars today, I'll introduce them uh, before they give their, their talk, uh, will be exploring both the ways in which Dante um, worked on the margins, um, but also in a way brought the margins to the center in, in some important respects, and the specific links between Dante and the Holocaust, um, including in the way in which Primo Levi um, incorporated um, elements of Dante into his own writing, was influenced by, but also other kinds of maybe more subterranean uh, influences um, um, that, uh, that, that our two uh, speakers will, will explore. It's um, a lecture that I think has been, was delayed a bit because of the uh, <laughs> event, uh, but, but in fact uh, brings together two um, important uh, centenaries. The first is the, the first centenary of Primo Levi's birth, um, which was in two, 2019, that is the centenary was, and then uh, the 700th of Dante's death in 2021. Um, and between those was, of course, uh, the pandemic. So um, let me describe very briefly the, um, the schedule of tonight's event. Um, I'm going to introduce uh, Robert Gordon first, and he'll talk for about 20 minutes, I think. Um, and then I will introduce Martin Eisner, and then I might ask a question or two, and then I'll open it up to you, and I really hope that uh, people have questions and we can have uh, a conversation. So first, Robert Gordon. He's Serena Professor of Italian at the University of Cambridge. He works on the literature, cinema, and cultural history of modern Italy. His books include a study of Pasolini, several volumes on Primo Levi, and a wider history of, Itali of Italian cultural responses to the Holocaust, 
And I really enjoyed reading uh, some of Professor Gordon's work and Professor Eisner's work. That's one of the things when you, or at least when I introduce somebody, I try to, try to uh, look into their scholarship more, and it was really a pleasure. He taught at Oxford and Cambridge Universities, where he is now, and he's the former senior editor of the journal Italian Studies and a former trustee of the British School at Rome. And he was elected a fellow of the British Academy in 2015. And tonight he will be speaking on Primo Levi and Dante cosmologies. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for that introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Let me see if this works. Yeah, okay. Um, thank, let me just say some thanks, first of all, particularly to Filippo, who has uh, been such a generous host and also has persisted because this invitation uh, came originally, as you were saying, Nathaniel, a few years ago, and uh, uh, we never thought it would happen, I guess. So it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I should apologize. I'm, I'm still fairly jet lagged. It's about two, 10 past two in the morning for me. Um, so I may flag at some point during this presentation, but um, I hope it won't be too noticeable. Um, so anyone who works on uh, Primo Levi, uh, but more than that, anyone who reads him for the very first time, perhaps at high school in Italy, which happens quite widely, soon learns that Dante is at the very heart of Levi's literary and moral universe starting, I think, from the remarkable, really quite remarkable set-piece moment of his dialogue with his French companion, Jean Samuel, in the chapter entitled The Canto of Ulysses, in his first book, If This Is a Man, where he desperately and really quite absurdly tries to remember Dante's Commedia in Auschwitz. Levy's biographer, one of his biographers, Carol Angier, comments quite powerfully, I think. If one day there is a new Holocaust and we can save only one chapter of one book from the 20th century, it should be this one. Chapter 11 of If This Is a Man, The Canto of Ulysses, in which a 24-year-old Italian tries to remember, recite, and explain Canto 26 of Dante's Inferno to a 22-year-old Frenchman in Auschwitz. I always quote this to my students because there's something really quite uh, powerful about this. But actually in this talk I want to argue that there are also other affinities that bind Levi to Dante, other shared strands of imagination and epistemology that transcend the vast distances that separate them in history, temperament and belief, uh, literary style and voice. And these affinities are not necessarily signaled by citation or allusion. In fact, often enough, what I'll flag up here are intersections that pass through webs of intermediaries, other voices, other writers. We could think of Italo Calvino or Raymond Cuno or even Empedocles and Aristotle. So that Dante, kind of in inverted commas here, uh, for Levi can seem rather like a container term, a vessel of ideas and perspectives on the world, as much as he is a cited canonical author. And those intermediary names might suggest, as they might suggest in very different ways, the, the terrain that I'm interested in is principally the terrain of science, uh, forms of scientific knowledge of the world. Both Dante and Levy have long been connected to the scientific imagination. Levy, of course, as a chemistry graduate and a career-long industrial chemist, a specialist of paints and varnishes. Dante as a poet, a politician, who educated himself, a bit like uh, Filippo has shown in his work, uh, a kind of autodidact of some sort, but who educated himself in the mysteries of science or natural philosophy and transmuted this into poetry. And so there's already, a, apparently at least, a, a dramatic contrast there, quite beyond the seven centuries that divide them uh, in time. On the one hand, we seem to have a technically trained scientist of the 20th century, and on the other hand, we have a kind of dilettante, an, an amateur, an autodidact, uh, poet scientist, if you like, in, in Dante. But actually, this contrast is and in part, at least, only, only apparent, only superficial. 
The Levy scientist that interests me here, at least, is precisely that other uh, scientist in Levy, the amateur scientist, the self-educated Levy, rather like Dante. We can think of this particularly in a collection that some of you might know uh, called Other People's Trades uh, of 1985. This is from the preface. Uh, where Levy says, the essays collected here are the fruit uh, of my more than 10 years of wandering as a curious amateur. They are field invasions, incursions into the trades of other people, poaching expeditions into closed hunting grounds, raids into the boundless territories of zoology, astronomy, linguistics, sciences that I have never studied systematically and which precisely for this reason exert on me the enduring fascination of unfulfilled and unrequited loves and stimulate my wireistic and nosy impulses. So both Dante and Levy are, in this field at least, curious, dilettante, non-specialists, encyclopedists, eclectics, drawn to hybrids and new unsettling languages of knowledge, quite beyond the specificity of Levy's chemistry degree or even, indeed, Dante's totalizing theological system. So all this, though, is quite generic and, uh, and overarching, uh, and I needed to push further uh, into this uh, intriguing connection. The more I looked into it, the more struck I was that Dante and Levy actually shared more than this. They shared a, a series of quite specific scientific fascinations, specific scientific fields that they were drawn to again and again as forms of knowledge, even if dilettante forms, and sources of literary creation. So I'm not a Dante specialist at all, <laughs> um, although I've taught Dante to some students, uh, poor them. Um, so I looked for some help and I found a synthesis. As a synthesis, I found an article by someone I know well, a friend and colleague from, from Britain called Simon Gilson, which, who, who summarizes the state of knowledge, uh, at least when he wrote this article about Dante and medieval science. Uh, and Gilson uh, gives a very useful taxonomy in this article. Um, a series of sciences, of scientific categories and disciplines that under which he then proceeds to kind of uh, lay out the state of the state of Dante's knowledge and the state of our knowledge about Dante's, uh, Dante's uh, work in this area. I'm not going to go through this list in, t in, in very great detail, but I was genuinely struck by how many items on this list uh, find a really a, a direct counterpart in Levy's work both disciplines that have survived from the 13th, 14th century through to the 20th and indeed 21st, and perhaps more surprisingly, some of those sciences which no longer look like sciences, which perhaps have receded into folklore and pseudoscience, nevertheless, Levy uh, found interest in them. So just to give you some uh, examples, in physics, it's not often noted, but Levy graduated with a second uh, thesis in the field of physics uh, alongside his chemistry studies. You can see a, a picture of his sottotesi, his second, second thesis for his graduation degree. Intriguing. Uh, in medicine, uh, it's now quite widely known that the very first piece of published writing that Levy produced on Auschwitz was for a medical journal. Uh, kind of general practice medical journal, uh, along with his friend and fellow survivor, um, Renzo de Benedetti. Um, so there was a, a medical, a medical uh, dimension, at least, to, to the foundation of Levy's uh, experience as, a, as an Auschwitz uh, witness. On animals, there's been a whole range of recent, really rather brilliant work on uh, Levy's immersion in the meto metaphorical but also ethical uh, dimension of animality as part of his Holocaust testimony. So there's a fascination with animals that permeates his work. This is one critical study by uh, a friend and colleague, uh, Damiano Benvenu. Even mineralogy, you wouldn't expect this, but if any of you have read the periodic table, you'll know that there's an extraordinary chapter, uh, Nickel, about Levy's experience of working in a mine uh, just before his deportation. Uh, and the really rather remarkable magical experience he had uh, uh, sort of in hiding or semi-hiding just before the darkest time in his life. And on it goes, alchemy too. Al Levy uh, developed an extraordinary fascination for alchemy as the origin, the er story 
of his beloved chemistry that he studied as a student. And from alchemy, so too, he developed a remarkable interest in magic, also on Gilson's list, and also a sort of prevalent part of the scientific knowledge of the Middle Ages, and so on and so forth. We can keep going by going back to that quotation from the preface to Other People's Trades, where Levy himself presented at least three, a sample of his own as it were, the ta his own taxonomy of the scientific disciplines that fascinated him. Zoology, astronomy, linguistics, he flags up there just as a kind of uh, throwaway list. Two of those are in Gilson's list in one form or another, zoology, astronomy, linguistics. Well, I hardly need to tell the dentists in the room that ling linguistics, if you want to call it a science, is, of course, right at the heart of uh, Dante's literary and philosophical universe. Uh, as, as it is of Levy, since Levy is one of the great analysts of the, the problem of representing the Shoah in language. So linguistics is a very powerful presence in both. But the particular science that I want to draw your attention to and focus on for the rest of this talk is the other, the third in that list, astronomy. Dante and Levy's shared fascination for the stars, for cosmology, and indeed for a certain kind of cosmogony as well. Cosmology and astronomy, of course, sorry, I've missed the list, but uh, cosmology and astronomy, of course, pervade Dante's conception of the Commedia and of the afterlife in it. In his repeated charting of the time and space of the planets and the stars, in the whole ordering edifice of his universe, and in the astonishing literary and allegorical energy that he derives from them. Levy shared the same principles of a cosmology as a vision of an ordered machine of the universe, that's his own phrase, balanced between rule and exception, order and chaos. A quite well-known quotation from another uh, essay in Other People's Trades uh, encapsulates this and uses this phrase, the machine of the universe. Life is rule, says Levy. It is order that prevails over chaos. This is the scientist in him. But the rule has creases, unexplored pockets of exception, license, indulgence, and disorder. Woe betide us if we erase them. They contain perhaps the seed of all our tomorrows, for the machine of the universe is subtle, and subtle are the laws that govern it. So this play between order and chaos uh, taps into a kind of fascination for astronomy, cosmology, the machine of the universe. And often for Levy, this holds true uh, metaphorically, materially, in the material science of the world, chemically, if you like, but also literally, astronomically. Levy talked in a letter to the publisher of his poetry of what he called an astronomical seam a filone astronomico, an astronomical seam running through his work. And he's right, it's not been noticed a great deal before, but if we look closely, there are, there's a whole series of texts, of poems, stories, and essays, in which the eye of the astronomer, and astronomy is an optics, by the way, and that's another science that both Levy and Dante uh, were powerfully drawn to, so the eye of the astronomer and the scale of the cosmos are front and center. Levy was fascinated by the Big Bang, by black holes, by stars, planets, satellites, moons, our moon. These are some of those uh, entries, I think, in an extended list of short essays, poems, um, stories that, um, that Levy in, interrogate, in which Levy interrogated uh, cosmologies and astronomies. I'm not going to go through, don't worry, I'm not going to go through the <laughs> every one of these stories uh, by any means, but well, it would be interesting to do so. Uh, but I would like to underline two devices, if you like, that run through these stories, two devices that ch challenge and transform our imagination. So they're vessels for kind of understanding the world, transforming our knowledge of the cosmos, but also vessels for wonder at the immensity of the cosmos. And these cut through this body of work. They resonate with Dante and his cosmology, I think. 
And I would say, and perhaps we could discuss this if people are interested later, they resonate very powerfully with, with Levy's other work as a witness to the Holocaust, which is a shadow that is never far from his mind. The two dimensions, the two aspects I want to look at or flag up are on the one hand perspective and a play, a sophisticated play of perspective, and on the other hand uh, issues of uh, scale, uh, scales of knowledge and scales of vision. For both Dante and Levy, uh, these, these devices, these astronomical devices of perspective and scale are tools to refine our knowledge, to correct errors, to learn to see better, to see the physical world, but then by extension also the moral universe and human history within it. For this reason, both are also fascinated by the origins of the universe, so by cosmogonies in some sense, the creation story for Dante, the Big Bang for Levy, but actually Levy too, I'll mention this later on, uh, was also fascinated by the stories of Genesis uh, and the creation myth as one of the devices with which he interrogates the cosmos, but actually also the concentration camps. So several of the texts in this list uh, play around with questions of distance, perspective, astronomical scales of space and time, typically by recalibrating our perspective, that we, our planet Earth perspective, when seen from afar. So when seen from the moon, you can see from the titles, I think, what I'm talking about if you don't know these texts. So he reflected on the moon landings of the late 60s. He wrote stories about... Uh, uh, new, new, new planets discovered, uh, the, the late story fans on Delta Chep was about a, a planet, uh, I think, recently dis uh, rediscovered or, or researched around uh, the time he was writing uh, in the 80s. He's, his story, A Tranquil Star, is an imagined story of an astronomer uh, looking outwards onto, uh, from a, a, a South American um, observatory and the contrast between the life of the poor astronomer guy and the uh, cosmic vision that he's seeing from his, from his telescope. So Levy uses these perspectival shifts. What does the Earth look like from afar? What does the, the cosmos look like from a humble individual staring through a telescope? To, to adjust and reflect on man's position in the universe, to ponder questions of space, human scale, and also, crucially, human language. So the power of these shifting perspectives and shifting scales to also transform uh, human language and its potential. So this is, in other words, a kind of astron astronomical optics redeployed as a form of ethics, I think. So to give a couple of examples, um, again, I won't go through these in any detail, but these are a couple of poems, uh, one about on the left about the Big Bang in the beginning, one about black holes, the black stars, where the space and time shifts in scale. So there's a kind of, it's, you know, this is not quite commonplace, but it's interesting to see Levy coming back again and again to this question where, say, the scale of human time, fellow humans for whom a year is long, is contrasted with the scale of cosmic time from the Big Bang, 20 billion years before now, and so on and so forth. On the right, we have a kind of cultural uh, iteration of this where the language of human poetry is kind of dismantled by the shift in scale to the cos cosmic. So let no one sing more of love or war, an allusion to sort of the great classical tradition of poetry, uh, in contrast to the new order of this cosmic universe where knowledge is emerging of uh, time, Im unimaginable scales of uh, cosmic time. So the order that names the cosmos is gone, and so on and so forth. He also reflects in these stories on the decentering of the human, again, a quite commonplace uh, modern uh, reflection. Not only are we not the center of the cosmos, we are alien to it. We are a singularity. The universe is strange to us. We are strange in the universe. So this kind of sense of displacement and loss through the cosmic perspective is powerfully present here. Sorry to rush through these. Language in this, uh, in A Tranquil Star, he spends quite a lot of time reflecting on the kind of impost, the inadequacy of human language. A very familiar uh, topos, if you like, for, from, da uh, from Dante, the in inadequacy of language, but also from a whole field of reflections on the, on the Shoah and the Holocaust. But here it's deployed through astronomy. The star was very big, very hot. Its weight was huge. 
that this is hopeless, right? To talk about stars, our language is inadequate and seems laughable, like someone trying to plow a field with a feather, and so on and so forth. And finally, in this kind of run through a sample of examples, I wanted to jump back to a work uh, more directly about the Holocaust. This is from his second book, The Truce or the Reawakening, where um, the state of post-war, post-Nazi Europe is redeployed and reimagined using this kind of, cos in this case, cosmo cosmogonical language, uh, where he talks about, as he's trying to navigate his way home, from, uh, from Auschwitz. In those days and in those places, shortly after the passage of the front, a high wind blew across the face of the earth. The world around us seemed to have returned to primeval chaos. Uh, and towards the end there, he says, uh, they were like the particles of the four elements in the poetic cosmogonies of the ancients. So there's a sort of resource there, a poetic resource, a metaphorical resource, but what I'm trying to suggest is that this, is, this connects to a more um, a direct and literal fascination with uh, cosmology and, and astronomy. Dante, too, you, tell me if I'm going over time, by the way. I'm, I'm not very good at keeping time. Um, Dante, too, uses uh, scale, scale models, in both the sense of scale as the kind of sheer vast uh, size of, of his vision, but also the literal, more literal uh, material sense of scala, scale as a ladder, a ladder of vision or a ladder of ascent. Uh, scale sets in space his theological truth, it structures his journey of re-education, and thereby, in quite similar ways, I think, the human man and earth is decentered as part of this macro structure. And just like in Levi, Dante must train or retrain his vision, his perspective, in order to understand this. To illustrate this, I'd just like to, to dip in, into, very nervously, uh, into the text of Dante's Commedia, just to show how some, many of the same kind of dynamics are at work in Dante. Again, not, not because Levy was aware of this and was quoting these pass passages with any great erudition, but simply in ways in which they chime with each other. They seem to have the same kind of uh, forma mentis, as they would say uh, in Italian. And, and it's quite striking that the number of... Uh, points of intersection that you find between them. So I'm thinking particularly of a, of a passage from Paradiso, which is not one that, that, that Levy quotes at all, but it's sort of interesting to me precisely for that. This is the, the, the phase in Paradiso where Dante is in the sphere of the fixed stars, right, beyond the, beyond the spheres of the planets and about to head into the kind of higher spheres um, beyond, uh, where twice... Twice, Dante turns and looks back over his journey, right? In rather that same way of looking from the cosmos back onto the earth and appreciating the difference in perspective and scale. So uh, this is Beatrice telling him, look downwards, see what I have set beneath your feet already. Much of the world is there. And further on, my eyes returned through all the seven spheres and saw this globe, this earth, in such a way that I smiled at his scrawny image. This is Mandelbaum's, I think, very good translation, very powerful translation. Um, and in order to do so, he needs to refine his vision. That's precisely the kind of adjustment and, and learning process, epist uh, the epistemology that I was talking about before. Beatrice says, you have need of vision, clear and keen. So this is a constant process in Paradiso, but it has a particular cosmological purchase here when he's looking back over the spheres and back down to earth from, from the higher heavens. And this look marks an interesting transition, by the way, to another physics. So some, I've read some scholars, perhaps the dancers can tell me if the, how, how seriously this is taken, uh, but some scholars who have seen a kind of uh, foretaste in Dante of the shift away from Newtonian physics to a kind of quantum physics of the higher spheres. I don't think we need to go quite that far to see Dante as a prophet of quantum physics to see that something quite striking kind of spatially and temporally is going on there. Um, and even without that anachronistic leap, I think we can see a connection to Levy's astronomical play of scale and perspective. Indeed, there's even a link to Levi's founding Dantean text, the Canto of Ulysses chapter, since famously in these same canti, uh, it's Ulysses' uh, journey that Dante sees down on earth, his folle volo, his mad, what's the translation here? Mad course, I think Mandelbaum has. So when he looks back in Canto 27, 
I had traversed all of the arc of the first climb from its midpoint to its end, so that beyond Cadiz, I saw Ulysses' mad course, and to the east could almost see that shoreline where Europa was sweet burden. I should have seen more of this threshing floor, and so on and so forth. So it, there's a connection even to that uh, Levi-Dante connection, and there's more too, because in between these two uh, perspectival shifts back to Earth, uh, who does Dante meet, apart, among others? Well, he meets Adam, the first man. And Adam, too, is linked to Ulysses uh, by Dante. Uh, both are transgressors of limits, after all. And Dante talks with Adam of the origins of the world, so of cosmogony, and indeed of the origins of human language, so that fascination with language is there as well. So I won't, I won't read the quote here, but it's in Paradiso 26 there. Adam is also there in Primo Levi. Okay, yeah, I'm coming to a close. Sorry, sorry to go on too long. <laughs> Adam, there's a lot of material here. Um, Adam is also there in all these texts of Primo Levi is a fascination which runs through uh, his, uh, his astronomy, but also through his work on Auschwitz, since his, uh, Adam is another figure who emblematically stands for the first man, the last man, uh, the victim in Auschwitz, and this is work that's, that other, other more general studies of Holocaust testimony have has, has, uh, asserted, I think, very convincingly. The bond between Dante and Levy that I'm proposing here is a very unstable one, right? It's very liquid and fluid. It's not philological. I'm, I, I'm convinced that there's a kind of elective affinity in their uh, epistemology and in their science, meaning uh, science in the sense of the disciplines of modern science or natural philosophy, but also simply science or scienza as knowledge. Um, they operate through an almost magical array of ways of seeing and re-seeing or re-learning the world through a supple uh, shift in, shifting in perspective and a kind of capacity for rescaling our knowledge. Um, it's a remarkable kind of shared um, capacity that they have. In that light, I wanted to finish, but I'll, I'll, I'll skip this with a final intertext. Again, a quite tangential, no documented link to Dante or Levi, but one which for me at least captures uh, the essence of this fascination of scale, perspective, and science, which combined has a capacity for transforming our knowledge of the world. It's a film that many of you will know, but it really chimes with what I've been saying. It's this remarkable, like, 10-minute video by the Eames, Ray and Charles Eames, from the 1960s, 70s, called The Powers of Ten. Um, by the way, Levy himself wrote stories about the mathematical powers of 10, and Dante, as we all know, built his cosmos around the numerology of the number 10, among many other numbers, but that's a coincidence. Uh, this film, as many of you will know, is a film, a remarkable kind of educational documentary, which for, for many uh, showed for the first time the capacity to kind of navigate macro and microcosmic uh, scales of knowledge and vision uh, simply by showing a couple having a picnic in a park in, Chi uh, in Chicago and then sort of navigating outwards to powers of 10 higher and then navigating inwards to the, the infinitesimal microzones of um, uh, a sort of subatomic level. It seems to me that Eames feel, Eames, the Eames's film captures exactly that kind of nexus of cosmological knowledge and wonder that both Dante and Primo Levi in their very different ways uh, display for us and offer to us as readers. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Robert. And next up, we have Martin Eisner, who is the chair of Romance Studies and a professor of Italian at Duke University. He's the author of Dante's New Life of the Book, A Philology of World Literature, and Boccaccio and the Invention of Italian Literature, Dante Petrarch Cavalcanti and the Authority of the Vernacular. He's currently working on a biography of Boccaccio, and tonight he'll be speaking on Black Limbo, Dante Boccaccio, and Global Ethnic Studies. So please welcome Professor Eisner. Hi, thanks. Um, thanks so much to Filippo for, for the invitation and for um, this uh, Humanities Institute for, for hosting us. Let me, this is uh, why you come early to make this not happen, but it's happening anyway. 
Um, all right. So, um, so many things to dialogue about, Robert, as, as, yeah, as, you'll, as you'll see very clearly. Um, I will um, start with, with Dante and then, and then come to uh, Primo Levi uh, towards, towards the end. Um, maybe, um, well, you'll, you'll see all those connections there. So, um, so yeah, so, the, so the, this image um, of Dante among the classical poets in limbo, uh, coupled with my title, Black Limbo, uh, would seem to be relatively easy to interpret. The dark skin of the pagan poets should mark their exclusion from the calculus of salvation, confirming their placement in the first circle of hell. This interpretation would be in keeping with some recent work in medieval studies. Um, I'm thinking of Geraldine Heng's The Invention of Race in the European Middle Ages and Cord Whitaker's Black Metaphors, How Modern Racism Emerged from Medieval Race Thinking. And is that subtitle of Whitaker's work, um, How Modern Racism Emerged from Medieval Race Thinking, that lays bare the logic of this approach that both brings into focus um, the discourse around what we now call race and tends to understand uh, those, those racial situations largely through a modern lens. So even as it brings race into focus, this approach uh, threatens to reduce the alterity of the past uh, that such an account might, might provide. So um, in this in this talk, I want to ask whether there might be alternative histories of thinking about human difference in the pre-modern West. If scholars have located racist or proto-racist discourses in the medieval world, might there also be anti-racist counter-arguments to be found in the historical archive? So the second half of my title may give away my response to that question, as probably an, an affirmative Dante, Boccaccio, and Global Ethnic Studies. I want to argue something like that Dante and Boccaccio represent this counter tradition um, of thinking about human alterity that could be understood not only as anti-racist, but as part of an expanded idea of ethnic studies that reaches beyond the Americanist roots of that, of that discipline to, come to, to think about not just um, across space, but also across, across time. So, um, the, the connection that I'm going to propose here between uh, the problem of pagans, such as those in limbo, and contemporary ethnic studies is one that's actually supported by uh, medieval thinking about precisely these words. So um, in Isidore's etymologies, the, the self, seventh century um, resource, reference book, for thinking about um, these kinds of relationships, uh, Isidore notes that pagans, that is Gentiles, and these are all really slippery terms that, that have a lot of different uh, deployments over, over time and space. So I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to nail anything down. I just want to point to the association that's made in Isidore, um, where he says pagans, that is Gentiles, are ethnici in Greek or ethniki in Greek. So the link then between pagans and ethnic fits into this medieval discourse as much as it fits into our modern discussion. So I want to investigate this medieval thinking about pagans first in the Commedia from the perspective of the manuscript that I started with, which is uh, in the British Library, it's Yeats Thompson 36, and then very briefly um, talk about uh, a few of Boccaccio's stories that deal with this theme. And then in the final part, I will connect um, back to, to Primo Levi's response to Dante in, in the Canto of Ulysses that Robert kindly left out largely of his discourse so that I could, I could um, come in and talk about it. So um, although, although my title, um, Black Limbo, is not meant uh, to be descriptive but uh, a provocation, um, it is remarkable the extent to which art historians who have examined um, Yates Thompson have uh, absolutely ignored Virgil's distinctive physiognomy. Uh, and, and this is true from the 20th century, mid 20th century analyses of Pope Hennessy and uh, Millard Mice up to more recent 21st century uh, explorations of the manuscript by Bolatti and Lehrer. The art historians have consistently 
drawn attention to the extraordinary use of color in the manuscript, uh, but never talk about the, um, the coloration of Virgil's skin. Um, because this uh, color has not been visible to art historians, there's very little scholarship on this distinctive feature. For art historians, the main issue at hand has always been the attribution of these particular images, right? Wh who, which artist was responsible? And there are three different things that I won't talk about, um, rather than, than this particular detail. So um, the manuscript itself was uh, significantly executed in the uh, 1440s for Alfonso de Aragona, uh, who was in Naples. Uh, it, was, it was a watershed moment in the interactions between Europe and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and while these new exchanges might have informed the artist's choice, he might also be drawing on a tradition that um, scholars like Paul Kaplan have identified uh, that begins with Frederick II, where there's this presence of, um, of black figures, of dark-skinned people, as part of this a universalist ambition that characterizes the empire. So, so it may not be that this is a, a reflection of an historical change, though that historical change is in process, uh, but it may also be the, the witness and the, the afterlife of this uh, imperial universalism that um, the Aragonese take up from, um, from previous, uh, from, from Frederick II and his uh, family. So um, significantly then, this dark skin would be uh, most often used in this period to represent um, not sub-Saharan African uh, figures, but, but really, but Muslims and, and Islam. Uh, so, so it's not, the same uh, set of relationships. It doesn't signify in the same way, but it does signify some kind of cultural difference that's being interrogated. Um, and significantly here, but, um, Virgil is not just a token figure, uh, right? He doesn't appear just once, as if you think of um, representations of the Pentecost, where there would be a variety of, of human um, physiognomies, but it, where each one is supposed to represent a different, a different world at the that will, the word will be preached into. But Virgil isn't just a, a token figure. He appears, of course, throughout this manuscript. Um, and he occasionally encounters others who um, significantly look just like him, such as uh, the poet uh, Statius, uh, who tries to embrace Virgil's uh, feet. Now, Statius, for those of you who may not um, be familiar with the, the poem or know this, this passage, Statius is, of course, another classical poet. Um, and he is significantly the first saved soul um, that the pilgrim meets. And Statius will give Virgil both the Aeneid, uh, this, a seminal role in his, in his moral transformation from prodigality, and then he will um, attribute to uh, Virgil's fourth eclogue his conversion to Christianity. And, and it's after quoting uh, Virgil's fourth eclogue that Statius proclaims, uh, per te poeta fui, per te cristiano. Through you I was a poet, and through you I was a Christian. So Dante gives the classical text, Virgil's classical text, a mediating role that um, I think challenges the um, widely uh, held belief that you find in a text like uh, Jerome's letter to Paulinus. This strikes me as one of the most um, interesting letters. It prefaces all Bibles up through Gutenberg. Um, it's hard to find a translation of it. I had to go back to, anyway, that's, a, that's, another, that's another discussion. But um, the, this um, letter uh, to Paulinus, which, as I said, prefaces all these Bibles through the, through the 15th century, uh, insists on the separation between these classical texts and, and, uh, and Christian ones. So, in particular, Jerome calls attention to the fourth eclogue that led to Statius's conversion, saying that um, we never think of calling the Christless Maro a Christian because of his lines. Um, now, Dante uh, might agree with that. Um, he, he doesn't save Virgil, uh, but he does seem to say, but why not Statius? Why not have Statius saved through Virgil, uh, as, uh, as he does uh, in, in the poem? So while these examples of Virgil and Statius could show that the artist of Yeats Thompson chooses the skin color to represent the temporal or cultural gap between his world and antiquity, uh, there's a really remarkable moment when you arrive at the end of, um, 
of Purgatorio in Earthly Paradise. Uh, and this is the scene that confronts you where uh, the same physiognomy is used um, not just for, for Virgil and classical poets, but also for these figures who are represented here uh, who are the biblical authors. So both the authors of the Hebrew Bible and the authors of the New Testament. So instead of separating Virgil from the Christian God that he did not know, which is how Virgil puts it in Inferno 1, the illustrator aligns him with these, with these biblical authors. And so the, the visualization establishes this really surprising parallel between Virgil uh, and, and the Bible that Dante's poem simultaneously rejects. Right? Virgil is in limbo, he, the first circle of hell, he is not saved. And at the same time, it encourages us to think about how these two might be related since Statius converts through Virgil's um, poetry. So these, these sort of two competing uh, ideas within Dante's own text that the, that the illustrator seems to, to want to bring to the, to the surface. So um, later, later in the poem, just so that you have a better sense of what, how Dante deals with this problem of pagans, he continues to reflect on this problem up through, through Paradiso. And in Paradiso, a quite extraordinary thing happens, which is we find out that some pagans are saved. Um, and there are two instances that Dante gives us in the, in the heaven of Jupiter. Uh, one is Trajan, which is actually a rather traditional one. Uh, and the other is a character who is not represented in this image um, because he has no iconographic tradition. Um, his name is Riffius, and he exists only in two lines of Virgil's Aeneid. Um, and so, so Dante keeps thinking about this problem of pagan, the possibility of their salvation, and even delivers for us in this extraordinary moment with the eagle in the heaven of Jupiter. He, do, he gives us the possibility that a pagan um, could be saved. So, um, and one could say this, the whole Commedia itself sort of has the same relationship to Virgil that Statius proposes for himself, since the Commedia is constructed on all of these Virgilian textual materials, right? The structure of, of Inferno in large parts, many of the characters there. Um, and even here, the saved uh, pagan uh, comes from, from Virgil's text. Um, and so I, I love this, this image from, uh, of, of Virgil uh, holding his hand as he brings him into, into the, gates of, the gates of hell. Um, and I want to hold that image of, of, the, of the holding of the hands uh, just to, to move us forward a little bit into um, Boccaccio, who, who takes up a lot of these ideas um, that he finds in, in Dante's text and elaborates them in not so much in terms of, of space, uh, I'm sorry, ra rather not so much in terms of time, right, the problem of pagans and the distant path, but within his own historical world. So what is his relationship to, um, to contemporary figures or, or more recent historical figures like, like Saladin? Um, so Boccaccio um, extends on, and, and here I should maybe say that Dante's treatment of Saladin is also surprising since he puts him in uh, limbo, uh, not, so he's, he's damned and condemned, but with the virtuous pagans for reasons that really don't make any sense. Um, so, so Boccaccio develops this attention to Saladin in two stories in the Decameron um, that really bookend the, the text. So one is the um, third story of the first day, which some of you might know, it's the famous uh, story of, of the three rings. Uh, so the, the Saladin um, uh, attempts to trick the Jew Melchizedek by asking him he wants to get his money by asking him what the true religion is. And Melchizedek responds with the story of, of the three rings, um, which is the story of a father who gives three identical rings to his, to his children, um, but no one can tell which is the true one. Right? So it's this um, claim for, for the epistemological uh, problem of not being able to determine which is the true, the true religion. Saladin sets aside his, his challenge 
And as you see in the far right of that uh, illumination, uh, and this is different from the versions of the story uh, that appear elsewhere, they, it's not just that uh, Melchizedek escapes, is that Saladin and Melchizedek become friends. Uh, and you can see they join hands uh, in, the, in the far right there uh, as a sign of that friendship that they share. So a new community emerges um, that is formed across these religious differences that were the very theme of the challenge that was launched at the beginning. In the penultimate story of the Decameron, the 99th uh, Decameron Day 10, story nine, Boccaccio has Panfilo return to Saladin for another tale where this cultural conflict again comes into the foreground. Um, in the 90, this 99th story, uh, we find a Christian figure for the first time. So the previous one, right, we just had Saladin and Melchizedek. There was no Christian present. But here, the Christian figure of Mesor Torello, who at the beginning of the story, and it's a long story, I've given you the summary there. You're not going to be able to read it all. So I'll, I'll give you another, another summary here. It's, it's a very elaborate one. Uh, at the beginning of the story, Mesor Torello, encounters the Saladin, who is disguised. Um, he's wearing um, Italian dress because he's on a reconnaissance mission, because he knows he's going to battle these people soon, so he's trying to understand their army. Uh, Torello shows him great generosity. He gives him uh, robes, and uh, ultimately, his generosity towards the disguised Saladin is repaid when Saladin uh, discovers that he has imprisoned Torello, right? So they, he was in a battle against Saladin. He discovers him in his prison. And uh, his wife has been promised uh, to, she, she's free to marry a year and a day after he's disappeared. That day is coming. And uh, really a remarkable moment. Uh, Saladin provides Torello with a magic carpet ride. It's the, one of the very, very few moments of magic in the entire Decameron. And with the, when you take that magic carpet ride, where you arrive, this blows my mind still, he, he, he arrives into San Pietro and Cheldoro in Pavia, right next to the tomb of Augustine, the author of um, you know, The City of God Against the Pagans. So there's, there's a challenge here that Boccaccio is launching, uh, and uh, this is one that Boccaccio sustains in other works, like the genealogy of the pagan gods, where he wants to um, vindicate this tradition that Augustine and others had, had um, wanted to um, disregard. I guess that's the nicest way I could say it. Um, so... So we have this extraordinary scene where the, and he's wearing, um, I, should, I should have underlined this point, he's wearing this Muslim dress that Saladin was unwilling to wear on his reconnaissance mission, but now he's wearing it in the middle of, of, this, uh, of the church. It's, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary scene. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna turn, I, I could spend a lot more time on the uh, Boccaccio, I'm trying to uh, reel it in. Uh, so I want to turn now to, to, to Primo Levi. So, so Boccaccio um, really develops, I think, this transcultural or multicultural dimension of Dante's poem. Uh, and it's that same dimension that that 15th century uh, illumination that you'll, you see again here um, also emphasizes through the color of the poet's um, skin. But while Boccaccio develops this in a positive direction, fascist readers um, use Dante as an authority for far more divisive and disturbing purposes. And that's in the image on the right. This is the cover of a, a journal called La Difesa della Razza, which was first published in, in August 1938. And you can see there the separation of classical, uh, apparently Italian, um, from Jewish and black. Right, with the, the sword making the clear uh, distinction between them. Now, the image is accompanied by uh, a quotation from Dante's Paradiso V. It's in the upper left corner here, uh, the, where Beatrice is proclaiming, uh, be men and not like sheep gone mad, so that the Jew who lives among you not deride you. Now, Beatrice's argument is this, obviously very carefully selected uh, two lines. Beatrice's larger argument encourages Christians actually to follow the law um, that they are lucky to have as a guide to actions um, that they should choose to do out of free will. 
Um, but the editors of La Difesa use it, of course, to encourage not um, the proper use of free will, but instead to encourage this divisiveness that's, that's shown with the sword, right? The separation between um, uh, the Greek statue and this uh, representation of a Jew and um, black woman. So her point um, is not so much anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish, but to emphasize human responsibility and free will to, to guide action. Now, I mention this because Primo Levi calls particular attention to this journal, La Difesa de la Raza, and this particular passage uh, that is on the cover of it uh, in the periodic table. So in um, uh, the third chapter of uh, the periodic table, he says, just during those months, the publication of the magazine Defense of the Race had begun, and there was much talk about purity, and I had begun to be proud of being impure. In truth, until precisely those months, it had not meant much to me that I was a Jew. Within myself, and in my contacts with my Christian friends, I'd always considered my origin as an almost negligible but curious fact, a small, amusing anomaly, like having a crooked nose or freckles. A Jew is somebody who at Christmas time does not have a tree, who should not eat salami, but eats it all the same, who has learned a bit of Hebrew at 13, and then has forgotten it. According to the above-mentioned magazine, a Jew is stingy and cunning, but I was not particularly stingy or cunning, nor had my father been. And so the defesa de la raza in, in, Levy's, tell, in Levy's telling um, forces him to, to take on this new identity that he doesn't feel like he has. Um, and he comes back to this. In the, in the very next chapter of the periodic table, he will quote the passage that's on the cover of La Difesa de la Raza. Um, the racial laws, I'll quote this, um, the racial laws have been promulgated a few months earlier and I too was becoming solitary. My Christian classmates were civil people and neither they nor the professors had directed at me a hostile word or gesture, but I felt them growing distant and following an ancient code, I grew distant from them. Each look exchanged between me and them was accompanied by a tiny but perceptible flash of distrust and suspicion. What do you think of me? What am I to you? The same as six months ago, the peer who doesn't go to mass, or the Jew who in your midst does not mock you. Um, so Levy quotes um, this Dantean passage, not I think to propose that this view is, is Dante's, but to show how Dante was used um, for this new purpose, to change how Levy was perceived um, by, by his classmates. Now, this seems particularly important to me, the, the passage from Paradiso V that's on the cover of La Difesa de la Raza. So these two mentions seem really important as a context uh, for understanding the, the chapter on the Canto of Ulysses. Uh, where precisely the question of what is a man, right? What, is, what does it mean to be human, um, comes into, into center stage. So um, I, I guess I would argue that Primo Levi's responding to the Dante on the cover of La Difesa de la Raza, this may be misuse of Dante uh, in, in the Canto of Ulysses passage. And I'll just close, close with this um, extraordinary uh, moment that again, Robert, thank you for allowing me to, to take this um, wonderful, wonderful and disturbing passage. So here, listen Piccolo, open your ears and your mind. You have to understand for my sake, consider well the seed that gave you birth. You were not made to live your lives as brutes, but to be followers of worth and knowledge. And you can see how both of these, these two passages are, are talking to each other. So in the, in the chap, in the passage from Paradiso 5, it's be men and not like sheep gone mad. So the question of the human versus the animal comes into play on the one hand. Um, but here it's not to separate one group of humans from another, but you, um, but from brutes you were to, sorry, you were not made to live your lives as brutes, but to be followers of worth and knowledge. As if I too were hearing it for the first time, like the blast of a trumpet, like the voice of God. For a moment, I forget who I am and where I am. Piccolo begs me to repeat it, how kind Piccolo is. He is aware that it is doing me good, or perhaps it is something more. Perhaps, despite the feeble translation and the pedestrian rushed commentary, he has received the message. He has understood that it has to do with him, that it has to do with all men who toil, and with us in particular, and that it has to do with us too, who dare talk about these things with the soup poles 
on our shoulders. So in the hell of, on earth of Auschwitz, Levy transforms the words of Dante's condemned Ulysses into a plea for a common humanity that he characterizes as like the voice of God. Whereas the passage on the cover of La Difesa de la Raza had distinguished men from mad sheep, Ulysses distinguishes men from bruti, right, from, from brutes, that does not entail any division among, among those humans. Turning the voice of the condemned pagan into the voice of God, Levy both subverts Dante's theological vision and follows this other interpretation of Dante's thought that we found in Boccaccio and in that 15th century manuscript um, of, that I was, we saw at the beginning. So this fascist perversion of Dante, I think, helps bring into view the novelty of Dante's thinking about human worth across boundaries of culture, religion, and time that could characterize uh, what I've proposed is something like global ethnic studies. Thanks. Okay, so now we're going to all sit over here, I think, or at least the three of us are going to. And um, I'm going to ask two questions. Okay. I think the questions, well, the questions are related in my own mind. So, the first question is about language, and um, one of the things that's always struck me about Levy is, is he's, he's an acute observer and analyst of so many things, and language is one of them. Um, he has pretty extraordinary things to say about uh, Yiddish, which he encountered in... Uh, in Auschwitz, he didn't. He didn't really. I, he probably knew it existed, but he hadn't encountered it in in a firsthand way. About German, also uh, about uh, the, the 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 dialect that was spoken by Jews in in uh, in his region. Um, but what I'm wondering, and I've read a good amount of Levy, is does he also talk about his relationship to Italian, and or is that just the default medium? for his writing. And if he does talk about it or write about it, does, does he talk about how it might change or have changed given his experiences? Um, or is Italian just the kind of the, the water he drinks, the, the, the air he breathes? That's great. Is this working? Thank you. Um, that's a really interesting question. Um, because primarily uh, Levy's interest in language <clears throat> is manifest through the kind of interplay between Italian and other languages. Um, so he was an obsessive kind of uh, tracer and follower of, of the translations of his works into the languages that he knew and indeed some that he didn't know as well. Um, so there's a kind of back and forth between Italian and other languages that he was very attentive to. Um, he translated both ways sometimes, at least in fragments between French and Italian, English and Italian. Um, even in some of his letters and correspondence, there's some extraordinary kind of attempts to translate um, from Italian into English, for example. He sends his own translation of Leopard, a Leopardi fragment to one of his correspondents in London. Um, so um, your question is a really fascinating one. I'm trying to think about this <laughs> as I'm speaking. Um, he's certainly steeped in a certain, uh, he's certainly a remarkable, um, a sort of ludic writer in his own language. So one of the ways that you could perhaps answer your question is to say that he was uh, joyously uh, fascinated by the tricks he could play in his own language. Uh, and again, if possible, in other languages, but he trained himself in Italian. So perhaps the strongest evidence of his kind of the self-consciousness of his deployment of his skill as a manipulator of words perhaps uh, comes through in what he feels he can do with Italian. And that includes something I was kind of pulling against, but is undoubtedly a kind of center of gravity for him, which is a kind of allusiveness in his language as well, including a literary allusiveness. So 
This is why Martin's sort of uh, hypothesis is a brilliant one because Levy is, is not an erudite writer. He's not, certainly not a kind of literary intellectual in any conventional sense, but he, as he says, he's a man, un uh, uomo di buona memoria, like he's a man with a very good memory and also a kind of preternaturally good memory. He's always quoting, he's always playing games with words, allusions, turns of phrase that if you care to look closely enough or if you know uh, deeply enough your sort of canon of Italian writing, Italian literature, um, there's a game going on at every stage. So uh, perhaps that's the strongest evidence we have of Levi as, um, yeah, not, not someone writing in the literary canon, not someone even necessarily like influenced in the conventional sense, in the kind of Bloomian sense, or in any, any kind of literary sense, or high literary sense, <clears throat> by all these uh, writers that he's uh, quoting, but someone who is simply sparking off their words. So he's deeply, intensely engaged with, uh, with Italian, I would say, through that dimension as well. I'd have to think further about it, though. It's a brilliant question. And, and I don't have a lot to add, since I'm not a, a Levy scholar, but I, yeah. I do think the educational uh, system that, that Levy comes up through does place the, the sort of literary Italian at, at the forefront in a way that, you know, certainly modern America doesn't. So, so he's exposed to um, and naturally reads, you know, like the, Le the, the Levy engagement with Dante is, is partly a product of, of, this, of an educational yeah. system where you are reading that text. Uh, no, you know, so it's it's I mean, not that he doesn't choose to engage it here, not that it doesn't, but he he has it in his memory because he was forced to memorize it mm -hmm. uh, as well. So so that that um, that issue of formation and education seems significant to that. Yeah. Okay. So my second question is um, is actually connected to some of the things that you were saying uh, towards the end of your talk, um, Martin, and um, I was thinking of Paul Ceylon and. He, who's a, a Jewish poet who wrote in in, uh, in German, and his most famous poem is uh, Todesfuge, the Death Fugue, uh, which, I mean, there's so many ironies, very painful ironies in the poem, because um, he's talking, he's writing about, among other things, the, this kind of intimate, deadly embrace between Jews and German, and actually Jewish writers in the German language. Um, and it, it, on the one hand, there is a, a there is there is like I said this intimacy, but there is also a, a difference between them, Jews and Germans. That is, that can't be bridged even by language, even by someone who's such a great German stylist as as Ceylon is. And I'm wondering, and it is connected to my first question: um, Does Levy talk about? the relationship between Jews and Italians in anything like that or in any kind of taxonomical way that we could say they're, they're kind of exploring the same questions about identity or is that not, is, is there not that difference or is there not, you see what I'm trying to get at is, is you know, Jews and Italians have a long history, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, maybe they're not quite Italians, but in any case, the the, the two the Jews Jews are there, and the and the ancestors of Italians are there, and the, and they're interacting in all sorts of ways for a long time. So I'm just wondering whether the, whether he explores that um, at, at any point in his work. Sure. I go, uh, first, I mean, I yes, he he does he does, and there's a there's a there are various moments including, uh, you alluded to it, I think, yourself in the, the, the chapter at the start of the periodic table, which is a kind of through language, through this extraordinary um, Piedmontese Jewish dialect that some of his ancestors spoke. He tells a certain history of a certain kind of genealogy of at least the, the history of uh, assimilation, integration uh, of a certain corner of uh, Italian Jewish communities mainly through southern, southern France and the sort of migrations into that part of Italy. So he, he engages with it there. He also wrote a very interesting preface to, to, a, to a, a little kind of circulating volume on 
um, the history of Jewish Italy, I think, on I think it was centered on Venice, actually, but he, he wrote a preface to that where he reflects on um, Jewish history in Italy. So he tends to kind of um, follow a certain line which another great Turinese intellectual, um, uh, Arnaldo Momigliano, in a very famous essay, um, established a kind of baseline, a kind of na patriotic baseline uh, in Italian Jewish history, which said that Jews were emancipated alongside the formation of the Italian state in the 19th century. So there was a kind of harmonious alliance uh, between the two, as it were. And so Jews were citizens of the new Italian state and, and uh, made a kind of success of their newly emancipated identity through the establishment of the nation and therefore were kind of patriotic. And although Momigliano didn't say it, it also meant they were also, broadly speaking, as, as fascist or, or anti-fascist as, as the wider population. There, there was a kind of uh, affiliation to the fascist movement, more or less in proportion as there was in the wider population, because they were nationalists and patriots and broadly assimilated, and there was relatively little explicit anti-Semitism early on in the fascist movement there was plenty of implicit kind of racism and prejudice, I should say. So um, Levy, he was Piedmontese, Momigliano, and from the same kind of networks and community that Levy grew up in, and he tended to share this relatively pacific uh, understanding of a uh, kind of harmony between the modern Italian nation state and Jew the, the minority Jewish community. But there are always hints of um, of, a, of a darker side to this. So I quoted Carol Andrews' biography and her and the, the other prime, main biography in Thompson have looked into the fact that Levy's grandfather uh, committed suicide as he did, um, but for very different reasons, because of a kind of scandal in a provincial Piedmontese town, which was very probably driven by anti-Semitism. And Levy never really uh, acknowledges this but there are kind of hints. There are hints of division and prejudice and hints even in that private language of the Piedmontese Jewish dialect that of a need for a kind of um, secret language in order to kind of shore up a certain fragility in the community and so on and so forth. So I think there is a kind of um, a layer in Levy which understands that there's a complicated history. And then it comes out a little bit in the quotation that you had uh, when uh, he's struggling with his Jewish identity whilst dismissing it as anything relative, anything significant at all. So it's a kind of, you have to read between the lines a little bit, but I think he is sensitive to it in ways that are more, Nancy Harovitz has written about this quite, quite interestingly, where she kind of takes him to pieces a little bit in his very kind of throwaway uh, dismissal of his Jewish identity. I, I don't have much to add to that. <laughs> Okay, so we have some questions. Um, first, uh, Margaret. Well, just to say that it, what gets him in, in the camps itself is that he makes an error, and he tells us it's a fatal error, about self-identity. Because when he's picked up as a partisan, uh, he might have said, I'm an anti-Mussolini, I'm an anti-fascist, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a partisan. In many ways, he could have described himself, but he said, I'm an Italian Jewish faith. Which was the wrong answer. He might not have been sent to the camps had he said and had another locution. He didn't focus on that. He, he thought he might have been shot on the, on the spot if he said he was a partisan. But, yeah, but turns, out. turns out he was. Yeah. yeah, kind of, <clears throat> kind of playing off the topics that you brought up. Um, what exactly, in terms of the Jewish community in Italy? Where do they fit in terms of the broader Ashkenazi and Sephardic uh, um, uh, cultures? Is it separate or is it... And then, I guess, going on kind of what you were talking about, do we have an example of our, uh, a, a Holocaust survivor intellect from Germany that is Jewish and, let's say, that we could have the same presentation on linking to Guta or something, you know, something of that nature? So, and so I guess the, the question then is, is, is the topic of linking Dante to Primo Levi is, is he an outlier that, that, that's interesting to look at? Or is, is there really something different about the Jewish experience for the community in Italy in relation to the Italian broader culture 
that we didn't see maybe you know, in, in other European countries? I mean, that's a great question. Um, I mean, certainly there are, I mean, within, so Itel Kim, like the, there, there's a distinctive um, Jewish population in, in Italy that, you know, obviously mixes with um, other groups. Uh, but I, I'm fascinated by your question about the German side. Some, someone, someone in this room must have an answer to that question. I don't. Um, do you, I'm curious. <laughs> I don't, I don't know the German case so well, although I know that, that paradoxically Shakespeare kind of, uh, tra in a sense, in a way that transcends national culture, but is also very central to German literary culture. I mean, I, there's a kind of, there's been interesting work on the sort of prevalent recourse to Shakespeare as a, as a figure, a sort of resource for, for, um, a cert for quite a wide range of Holocaust. Um, well, yeah, a, a certain kind of uh, intellectually pitched um, Holocaust testimony so obviously there's a mass of testimony which is not sort of drawing on literary allusion in anything like the same way the other thing I would just say though like in a way conversely to what your question implies is that of course um, Dante's hell is an absolute commonplace across all languages just because it's hell right I mean so it, he's wide enough canonized as, as a name and a place and a title uh, for so I did quite a lot of reading at one point in my research of, of uh, you know 70 or 80 um, unpublished kind of local never circulated Holocaust testimonies vast numbers of them that's in some way or another saying this was like living in Dante's hell or this was worse than hell or Dante could not have imagined a hell worse than it's um, so what you can say is that uh, this kind of extraordinary capacity to uh, quietly, persistently, and sort of unpretentiously, if you can say, to um, enrich that simple illusion through allusion, through, um, through fragments of language, echoes of a word here or a phrase there, or indeed this extraordinary scene where he sustains an attempt to kind of fail to quite remember the text that he's trying to remember. It's, extra, it's, transform, it's an extraordinary transformation of a commonplace, in other words. So I think you can start from that end of the spectrum and saying, well, everyone says it was like hell. Of course, it, how, no one knows quite how to describe it. It's impossible, but you, could, you know, it's very common to say it was just hellish, it was worse than Dante's hell. Even high intellectuals do this, like Star George Steiner does this as well. You know, it's a, it's a very quick and easy way of kind of evoking something quite terrible. But Levy pushes and probes and reads and rereads and remembers and sort of turns phrases over in his mind. So in that case, I would say he is doing something extraordinary, not because it's, yeah, from, from that end of the spectrum, rather than it's simply an Italian who knows his Dante and therefore is using his Dante. Um, but the Goethe question is an interesting one. I mean, I know there's a famous, one, one thing, there's a famous uh, Jean Améry, uh, Hans Meyer, right? His, his, his most quoted phrase is, is no, 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 what's the phrase? <laughs> I can't remember it. Uh, no bridge led from death in Venice to death in Auschwitz or something like this. There's, there's, in other words, that there's a fracture between the high German culture and um, and, and Auschwitz, which is kind of insurmountable. So there's a kind of, there are kind of cases where it becomes a way of expressing the void that separates um, uh, German culture from, from the genocide. I mean, I would say that, it, to me, Paul Ceylon comes uh, close to that. Um, but also remember that time is very different because um, Dante is much earlier than Goethe. Um, so that's also uh, a factor to to consider. Um, in answer to your first question, I mean, the Italian, the, it's, it's very complex. There are, there are Ashkenazi and Sephardi migrants that come to what becomes Italy at different times. Um, and then there are, there are ancient Jewish communities, um, and there are communities in Sicily, there's communities in northern Italy, in Rome, obviously in Venice. Um, they have different dialects, but they also have different, what are called in Hebrew, nusach or minhag different uh, prayer rites, different melodies that are used that are distinctive relative to one another sometimes, but also different from Ashkenazi and Sephardi, which are the two main kinds of divisions. Yeah. 
So uh, in our last, um, when Carla Mallet came and, and told us about Dante's Mediterranean Awakening, one of the things that I, I think kind of came out of that talk, which, which I found interesting, is that Dante's reference to like Saladin and, and other you know, famous Muslim intellectuals kind of point to not really a close awareness of that world, but more kind of a, there. This is kind of a reference every, everyone <laughs> would make, right? At which being a Dante scholar kind of, you know, struck me as, oh, I always thought Dante was cool because he put these people in limbo and, and here you come and tell me that basically. And so I was wondering, do you see a difference in perception uh, when you read Boccaccio, yeah, let's say that, that that point is true, that for Dante, there is a sense that there is a world beyond Latin Christendom, but it's not, you know, you highlighted that temporality plays a bigger role in his thinking about the salvation of non-Christian, right, than geography, let's say. Do you think for that it has changed dramatically for Boccaccio, or just a curiosity since you... Yeah, I mean, I think um, Boccaccio is so interested in uh, lived social historical reality, you know, in a way that Dante is, of course, um, giving us that from a, a you know, point of outside of time. So there are these vivid Paolo Francesco, Ugolino, all those famous Ulysses as well, all these famous moments. Uh, but Boccaccio... Um, because you know of the genre and the and the way in which he um, narrates reality is is able to give us those kind of sustained new like a new community emerging in a way that is really hard to imagine Dante being able to pull off except in those moments where he saves Riffius out of nowhere right out of these one and a half lines from from the Aeneid so um, yeah I think I think he I think Boccaccio is doing something different. Um, and pushing that idea that's in Dante a little bit further, but I think he sees it in Dante. Um, so when he, in his commentary on Limbo, um, he draws in uh, the discussion, he draws in basically the discourse of the eagle from the heaven of, of Jupiter and, and, you, and applies it to what he sees in Limbo. So I think, so Boccaccio is linking those two moments in, in his commentary on, on the Divine Comedy, so he seems to see something there, and he calls attention to, um, to, to give the witness of one Trecento reader how unfitting it is to have Averroes and Avicenna and Saladin in, in the lim limbo space. So I'm not sure that, I'm not sure I would say it was, I, I think there are ways you can explain Avicenna and Averroes as connected to classical philosophy. I think Saladin remains problematic. Um, we have time for one more question, and you get to ask it. I'm not familiar with all your work, but what comes out in your presentations is that the color of one's skin then divides good, bad, evil, lesser. And I was wondering, in your readings, when, when did that happen? Because obviously the uh, origination of, the, of our religions and everything else had many different skin colors. When did we come to the point here in the U.S., for instance, that black is not as good as white skin? When, where was that? Did, have you thought of that? You're, you're beyond my historical scope with that question, I think. Um, but certainly, I mean, usually the, the, the sort of watershed moment is 1460, where there becomes a lot more contact. Um, between Europe and, and Sub-Saharan Africa um, in terms of representations. Right. Um, but, you know, those representations of dark skin earlier are also for al alterity. Well, um, but they're mixed. There, there's no value given to it, as I understand the readings. In other words, it's just another skin. Or is it has to do with the believers? You know, believers are white, and those who don't believe are not. Uh, you know, I mean, the, the illumination shows the, the biblical authors, right, with the same, so, so, so that's not, um, okay. yeah. 
I mean, that's, that's a great question. I don't know if you have I, don't, I can't really answer it. So next, I mean, I'm aware of uh, like famous attempts to, re to recover and question the kind of whiteness of, of Western trish like Black, Black Athena and, uh, and say, uh, Freud and uh, pointing out that Mo Moses was an Egyptian, was an African. And so, um, so, and so to kind of symptomatize exactly what you're saying, but all, all th those are cases of, those are always co oh, coming after, as it were, of showing how constructed the, the whiteness of the Western tradition is. It doesn't really answer your question, which is a very hard one, of when this shift took place. There's also very powerful work on just color, you know, the history of color. Um, so uh, is it Richard Dyer? There's a, on, on white, a book called White, um, which looks at, tra just traces the kind of uh, semiotics, you know, the meanings of the color white and how it emerged. Um, uh, and in contrast, the black in that's more to do with I think the last two or three centuries, which doesn't quite go to the origin of that you're looking for. Well, the, what I'll, what I'll say is that um, you know many societies have different have histories of often changing attitudes towards human skin color. Um, the Hebrew Bible and actually the New Testament as well does not describe the. In, with a very few exceptions, the, uh, the skin color of any of the figures. So if we were to ask, and in fact, the Hebrew Bible is very, very uh, distinctive in that it, it doesn't describe the physical appearance at all of many of the main figures. So if you were to ask, what did Abraham look like? You know, uh, and so on. So that's something to really, I've always, uh, one of the things I teach is Hebrew Bible, and that's something that I've always, uh, you know, talked about with, with my students. Uh, because there are texts, including obviously classical texts uh, from the Greek and, and Roman tradition, where, where physical appearance is described in great detail. Um, and so when it's not there, you should think about, you should at least meditate on what that means uh, in terms of how that particular society, or at least the authors who produced it and the editors, whether they thought that was important to include, not important, whether they're making a statement, and, and so on. So let's end it with there. And uh, thank you once again. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Filippo. Thank you to John and Juan.